Welcome back to the podcast that exists to enrich and inspire young Latinos. Bienvenidos al podcast que existe para enriquecer e inspirar a jóvenes latinos. Bienvenidos sean todos. Eh, tendremos hoy la gran oportunidad de tener una conversación profunda con mucho, con mucha sustancia, con un gran amigo, pero también con un profesor en teología, Ryan Hannon, y estaremos hablando específicamente de, de su libro uh, que acaba de publicar. Uh, Ryan, gracias por estar con nosotros. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, Ryan, before, before we jump into the book, can you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, so estoy aquí en Tennessee. Uh, vivo con mi familia. Yo tengo 10 niños y solamente una esposa. <laughs> <laughs> y tenemos una granja aquí con ovejas y vacas y uh, cabras y todos y gallinas también. So yo puedo uh, levantar uh, a las, las los gallos que están, uh, who are always waking me up a little too early. <laughs> So, um, anyhow, yeah, y, y también yo puedo hablar español en los, you know, los dos idiomas. Está bien para mí. So I, I, I grew up speaking Spanish, believe it or not. But here in Tennessee, I don't get to speak it that often. So I'm a little rusty. But, um, yeah, I'm a professor and living the dream out here on my homestead in White's Creek, Tennessee. Ryan, what a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. So, Ryan, you recently published this wonderful book, The Wheel Power Advantage and Building Habits for Lasting Happiness, ¿verdad? El poder de, de, de tener hábitos para una felicidad duradera. Uh, before I jump into some of the stuff that I found here, can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, so about two years ago, we started to write this book, you know, before COVID, right? Antes del pandemico. So life was so different when we finished the book. But we're so blessed because you know, we feel like for such a time as this. And the inspiration came from uh, Tom Peterson, a good friend and mentor in the faith. And he called me up one day and he said, you know, he had gone to confession and he heard those beautiful yet challenging words we all hear, you know, to go and sin no more. <laughs> and in prayer, he thought to himself, how am I going to do that? And you know, so we were talking on the phone the following day. And I, I, I had been teaching you know, undergraduates and graduates, philosophy and theology for the last you know, 15, 20 years. And I was sharing with them that my, my own students and myself too, you know, we struggle uh, with growing in holiness. There's real practical ways to grow in holiness. And it ends up the church has a ton of wisdom on this. And our faith is just full of, of these truths about what it means to enter into relationship with God, what it means to participate, right? Uh, with God's plan for our life and his mission for our lives. And so Tom and I really, as brothers in Christ, as, as, as fathers to, to our children, as husbands to our wives, as dear friends, started to sort of ask this question of ourselves. And that led just to a bunch of research and then uh, really the, the conclusion that we ought to write a book about what we had learned and uh, to share uh, in some ways the unending, you know, eternal truths of our faith, but hopefully in a way that somebody today can pick it up and really benefit from and just dive in the real practical application of how do I, you know, how do I grow in virtue? How do I build those habits that will really lead me to lasting happiness? And how do I, you know, how do I move away from those vices that rob me of, of peace and joy? Yeah, sí, para recibir you know, Cristo en nuestro corazón, es un evento, sí, pero no es un evento. Right? Es durante la vida. I mean, para, para crecer en amistad con Cristo, es, uh, you know, el llamado por cada cristiano, you know, for every single person, that is the goal, is, is you know, to constantly be growing in our faith. And, and you know, I, when Tom and I were doing a lot of research on this, it was fun because I really focused on the philosophy and the theology and, you know, and the deep teachings of the faith. And, and Tom, who speaks to 50 groups a year, if you can imagine, you know, I, I thought I had a lot of groups. I speak to about 30 conferences and, and groups a year. But he's on the road every week of the year, you know, and up until the pandemic, sometimes even more than that. And he would always bring it back to the real practical and say, hey, here's this beautiful truth from the Lord. Here's this beautiful theology. But what does this mean practically? And I think sometimes what happens with conversion is we over-spiritualize it or we over-theologize it. We, we think about the, the mystery of Christ's salvation, absolutely, but also just the real honest friendship that, that the Lord draws close to us. The Lord wants to accompany us. The Lord wants to walk with us, right? This is why we, we hear in scripture, 
you know, I am saved, I'm being saved, I will be saved, right? It's a continual event. And I think we, we have to, in some ways, remind ourselves that discipleship is not a one-time thing. If, if we had to get our act together, if we had to come to the Lord all perfect, we would never get there. That's not how the Christian life works. We, we come to the Lord with our brokenness, right? With our wounds, with our inabilities. And we ask the Lord to help put us back together. And the beautiful thing is, is as a loving father, he does that not despite of us. He does that with us. He calls us to participate with his grace and participate in his plan of becoming who he's called us to be. And I can share with you, Vicente, as a father, this is something that's made so much sense to me now is, you know, I have 10 beautiful children, imperfect father though I am, but what I want is I want, I want them to discover who they are. You know, I want them to discover what God has made them for. And when they need help, sure, I can do it for them. But very often what I want to do is I want to teach them how to do it. And our loving father is the same way. He wants us to, to become holy, not by just infusing us with holiness, but by helping us practice holiness, by giving us the grace and the sacraments, by calling us to learn about who we are, what he's called us to. And that's the, the, the really, in some ways, the, the joy of the faith, right? That's the joy of the gospel is that, that God is for us, not against us. And he doesn't want to destroy us. He wants to help us become who he called us to be, who we really are. That's really wonderful. And Ryan, I, I found um, some very interesting throughout the book, but I figure that if we can just focus on, on this, uh, our conversation, I, I believe that will be is, uh, very enriching for everybody that is listening to us. So, in tu libro mencionas cuatro verdades olvidadas and four forgotten truths. And, and the first one is God wants us to be happy. Sounds very simple, right? But tell me, tell me what are some of the implications? I want you to unpack this a little bit. ¿Verdad? Si voy y le digo a una persona, oye, Dios quiere que seas feliz. He's probably, it's very easy to dismiss. What are you talking about? Dios es el Dios de las reglas. Dios es el Dios uh, que si nos, nos equivocamos, nos, nos va a castigar, you know, if we, we make a mistake. So to hear that, you know, God wants us to be happy. What, what does that even mean? Yeah, think of the words of Christ, right? In, in John 10, 10, he says, I came that you have a life and have it more abundantly, right? <laughs> you have la vida, you know, full of life. And, and God has created us for a purpose, right? Each and every person, we have this universal purpose, you know, proposito, this, this universal purpose that we all have to, to you know, really become holy, um, to become that which God has made us to be. But we also have this very specific individual purpose. And an individual purpose is, is really... Um, to be happy, to, to, to come to know what it, what it is that will, will lead to our fulfillment. So think of it this way. Um, you know, St. Augustine says it best. He says, Lord, you created me for yourself, and my heart is restless until it rests in you, O Lord. So everything that's ever been created is made for a purpose. And even as humans, as we create, we create things for a purpose. You know, um, we, we fashion cups to hold liquid, and we identify how well that cup is fulfilling its purpose by how, how well it's holding liquid, right? And we would say that's a good cup or an excellent cup or, or not a good cup. Well, we were created by God and we have a purpose as well. And the truth is, the more we fulfill that purpose, the, the more human we are, the more we become that which we're called to be, the happier we are. And that's what God's about. God wants us um, to, to discover our mission. God wants us to be happy. God wants us to be in relationship with him. God wants us to live in right relationship with, with him, with each other, and with all of his creation. And what happens in the modern world very often is we think our happiness is going to be found outside of God or outside of our purpose or outside of what he's made me for. In fact, sometimes we think God's plan or even the plan of our own biology is somehow against my freedom. But, but the truth is true freedom is not to do whatever you want. True freedom is to become who you are, right? The cup is not free to become a hammer. That's a misuse of the cup, right? Though I, I could use this cup right now to... The pound and nails if I wanted to, but that's not the purpose of this cup. And so too in our lives. So God has created us, right? For each and every one of us for a particular purpose. And our happiness comes from really discovering that and participating with it. So yeah, God is a loving father. He wants nothing more for us to be fulfilled, for us to become who we are, for us to discover our purpose. Um, and in doing so, we will be happier. Um, we, we, you know, a, a lot of people point out the fact that Christians, you know, how can you say that when you suffer or things are bad? Because happiness is, is not about not having pain. Happiness is about knowing who you are and knowing where you're going, right? 
Um, and, and in truth, far worse things and far worse pain is felt from not knowing who you are and forgetting who you are or not knowing where you're going, not having a purpose or, or despairing. Um, I tell my children all the time, you know, with like physical pain, yeah, that's not near as bad as a broken heart. <laughs> that's not near as bad as self-doubt or despair. And God doesn't want us to have despair or self-doubt. God wants us to know who he is. In fact, the entire you know, Christian narrative of salvation is God reaching out to remind us who we are because dad knows what we need to be happy. It's, it's very powerful. Everything you say, I, I like the image that a cup can be used to hammer things, but it's not a hammer, verdad? We are meant to be who we are. And, uh, but one thing that I, that I like to, to, to maybe talk a little bit more about is, is the term happiness. Because we hear it everywhere, right? Be happy. What are we talking about really here, Ryan, when we are talking about happiness? You know, el, el sentimiento profundo y el sentido profundo de, de lo que es la felicidad. How would you define happiness as we are talking about here? Yeah, excellent question. So, so I have cuatro niveles de felicidad, right? There's, there's four levels of happiness that we can speak about philosophically. And in the book, we actually dive through this in this first forgotten truth. And we spend some time talking about the goal of remembering who we are. And very often the battle today is that we forget who we are, right? We're not our sin. In fact, sin is beneath us. Sin is too small for us. Um, you know, and so we're called to, to live in accord with, with our nature. So when we talk about you know, true felicity, true happiness, there, there's really sort of four different types of happiness. So, so the first one is physical pleasure, right? And that's not bad. It's just insufficient, right? I love spaghetti. I, I love champarado. I love a good, you know, feast day of our life, Guadalupe's coming up. We're going to get some, you know, some, some corn. <laughs> We're going to grind it up and put it in our hot cocoa, you know, but that's not going to fulfill me. I'm not made for just that. So even though those pleasures might be good, They're insufficient to fulfill the deepest longings of my heart. So that first level is, is about that physical pleasure. And in fact, there's a word for it. In, in the Latin, they call it laetus. And it means to fulfill one's immediate senses. And so it's easy. It's short-lived. It's almost like um, a reaction, right? You, you eat some good food or see something delightful, and you have this, this sensory you know, happiness that comes with it. And that's not a bad thing, but that can't fulfill us. And what happens, and if you look for all your happiness in that sort of lower level, laetus, that what we call level one, uh, we quote Father Spitzer uh, in the book. He writes a great book on happiness, and that level one won't, won't ever fulfill us. And if we become focused on that, we become pretty sad people that you know, are really envious, always are looking to, to be fulfilled physically. Very often, we become addicts to alcohol or pornography or drugs. And the next level of happiness is not about the senses. It's about your emotions. And it's slightly higher, right? It's a slightly higher level of happiness. It's about feeling good about oneself. It's the type of happiness you get when someone gives you a compliment, right? When they, when they tell you, good job, way to go. And that's also a good thing, but you're not made just for that, right? And we've all met people like this. I'm sure you've known somebody who is motivated by level two happiness. They always want to be affirmed. Or you may have experienced like I have where if, if someone else is congratulated in front of them, They immediately jump in and say, well, what about me? What did I do good? Or they try to sabotage the other person. Because that level of happiness, while it's good to have our ego or our mind affirmed, we're not made for that either. Well, actually, the next level of happiness is what we're made for more, which is to make a gift of oneself. This is the type of happiness that comes from using our talents in service of others. This is the type of happiness that comes from, from giving without counting the cost. And we notice that that type of happiness is much more pervasive. It lasts a lot longer. It, it takes a lot more willpower to enter into that gift of self. But even that is not all we're made for. We're not made just to, to sort of give ourselves away, though that's important. We're ultimately called to be in union with God. And so that the fourth, what we're talking when we say happiness here is we're talking about the ultimate happiness, which is being in communion with God. And the beautiful thing is, is that we can start to anticipate, we can start to live that while yet still here on earth. In fact, we can say the mission of the church is to reconcile man to God, right? While they await to be with him in perfection in, in eternal life. And so when we talk about real happiness, that's what we mean. We mean the sort of gift of self and this, you know, moving towards communion uh, with, with God. 
And so St. Paul says he's learned to be happy even when he suffers. He says, I've learned to be content in all things, whether in pain, whether he goes through the list of all things that happened to him. Well, he can say that because he knows who he is and he knows his happiness comes from fulfilling the, the plan God has for him. And so he really is content. And I think this is something we have to reclaim. God wants us to be happy, but all these physical goods of the earth, all these, all these things that help us you know, mentally, they're good, but they're insufficient. We're not made for food alone. We're not made for fame, right? Um, those things may be good, but very often they're insufficient to fulfill the deepest longings of our heart. We're made for more. You know, I love it. I love it. I love to understand happiness in this, this level because many times when we talk about happiness, it's like, okay, what are you talking about? Are you talking about pleasure? And I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking, how many of us get stuck in level one and two of happiness? How many of us believe happiness to be just the immediate pleasure, giving pleasure to our bodies? And how many of us uh, also get stuck in the level of, you know, looking for affirmation, looking for people to be liked, to be accepted? And it's okay, and, and I love that you said that, to, be, to give, you know, to receive pleasure and to be affirmed, it's not bad, but it's insufficient. Mm -hmm. And we cannot get stuck in there. So before we move on to the, to the second truth, Why, why do you think we get stuck in one and two, Ryan? Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, two reasons. One, because of our fallen nature, right? You know, I mean, after the fall, I mean, I, 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 pecado. I mean, there's sin. It's a reality that we live with. And so what happens is, is our, our, our horizon is lowered, right? St. Paul II says it so beautifully. He says that in the fall, um, our intellect is darkened, right? And, and you know, it's, it's, we don't see things as clearly as we ought to. We don't remember who we are. Um, think of the actual, the moment of the fall, right? Adam and Eve, after, immediately after falling, what do they do? They, they run and hide. And if we remember the story, what does God say, right? He doesn't, God doesn't say, what have you done? He says, where are you? Don't they stand? Where, where are you guys? Why? Is it because God forgot where they were or because, right? <laughs> he used, you know, MapQuest rather than Google Maps. No, he's, he wants them to stand up and say, here I am, Lord, forgive me. Right? I've sinned, you know, restore me to yourself. So God is constantly reaching out, but we forget that. And so I think a lot of times while level one and two happiness, that physical pleasure, that mental pleasure is meant to direct us to making a gift of self, is meant to direct us in humility to thank the source of, of that pleasure, the source of, of that affirmation, which is the Lord himself and the gifts he's given us but it tends to sort of invert itself. And so we just look only at ourselves or only at the material world. And if you live according to a philosophy that the you know, material world is all there is, then all you could be is level one and two. In fact, for, for, for many people who are materialists, who think you know, physical matter is all that exists, it's very hard for them to understand why you would seek to make a gift of self. Right? Uh, think of it this way. In the ancient world, on all the list of virtues and vices, compassion was always listed as a vice because the ancient world understood compassion as being giving a gift of oneself, giving when it hurts, right? Giving uh, without counting the cost. And they saw that as being taken advantage of. But when Christ comes, what does Christ say? He says, the thing that makes us most like God is not seeking our own pleasure or seeking our own ego. It's actually making a gift of oneself. And so what does God do? God comes and does that in the perfect way to remind us that that's what we're called to do as well, pour out our lives in service to others and in service to God. And this amazing paradox that's in that that we'll find happiness. And we can think of the Beatitudos, right? The, the Beatitudes, I mean, are all about this, right? Blessed are those, which literally the original, so Jesus would have been speaking Aramaic. And the Aramaic word for happiness is, is makarios. And makarios, so when he says blessed are, um, he's literally saying happy are, right? Happy are, You're the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. And what he's doing is he's directing our hearts and directing our minds towards what's ultimately good, beautiful, and true, towards that which our hearts long for the most. And the beautiful thing about the love of our Father is that you know, the things that are beneath us aren't bad. They're just, they're just not going to fulfill us. They're meant to point us towards what, who, who we really are, what we're made for. And that was one of the things you know, Tom and I were writing this book. We know this. I, mean, I teach theology. 
but just to constantly remind myself of that, <laughs> to constantly remind that you know, God is reaching out. What God wants for me is to reach back, right? That I don't have to do it on my own. That that you know that I'm not just junk and God has to do it all for me. But there's this real dynamic, right? Where I'm called to align my will with God's, and, and the Scripture is full of this, right? You renew your mind, right? <laughs> align your will with that of the Father's. I mean. You know, all these things that we hear again and again and again in the scriptures are pointing us to this truth. God wants us to be happy, but the things of this world, as good as they are, are insufficient. And if we turn them into uh, our ultimate end, we'll be unsatisfied. But if we recognize their goodness and what they're meant to point us towards, they'll actually be liberated to become what they're meant to be, which is an aid to help us grow in holiness. Yeah, I, I also believe that it's easier to just get get stuck there, right? Uh, it's a default in a lot of ways, yeah. right? We just fall into it. Yeah, and uh, I I like to connect this to to the to the second forgotten truth, that is, Christian life takes work, right? Probably by default we can just get stuck there, you know, make me feel good, and. Uh, physically and emotionally. And if, if I'm feeling good physically and emotionally, that's all it is. But what I like, and I like the term that you use, that is insufficient, mm-hmm. right? Because we are lacking purpose. We are lacking really meaning in our lives, right? We, we get stuck in the material and in, in everything that, that we can see and touch. Uh, and I like to connect that with the, the second forgetting truth that Christian life takes work, right? It's not just about I'm gonna to go to mass, give give my my dues, pay my dues, and right after I can do whatever I want. So, what can, can you unpack this this for us a little bit? What what do you mean by Christian life takes work? I yeah, have I, my I, own idea, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I those momentos in la vida cristiana que están muy importante. So, you know, cuando estamos recibiendo la Eucaristía es muy importante, muy profundo para recibir cuerpo y el alma de nuestro Señor en nuestras vidas. Es increíble. Y el segundo es cuando estamos saliendo de la iglesia. Cuando estamos saliendo para, para traer, para llegar la palabra de Dios, el, el amor de Dios, el amor de Cristo a todo el mundo. And, and those two movements, right, to, to, to receive the Lord into our heart and then to go out and bring them to others is, is where that really takes work, right? So first, you know, to really be open to receiving the Lord in our lives. Right to, to recognize that the Lord wants to heal us, the Lord wants to put us back together. That when the Lord looks at us, He sees us, right, as His beloved sons and daughters. I mean, I remember being, I, I had the opportunity to serve Mass with St. John Paul II um, in Toronto. So, our group of pilgrims for World Youth Day uh, were selected. We are the Eucharistic ministers for that Mass. Um, we we're one of the groups that helped out. It was amazing to be with the Holy Father. And he said that night, he said, you are not the sum of your weaknesses, right? That, that's not what defines us. Our sin does not define us, right? We are all sinners. We're all broken. But what defines us is our, our ability to, to really become what God sees in us, which is what? A beloved son or a beloved daughter. That He doesn't make junk. And I can tell you, as again, as a father, this, this makes so much more sense to me now because when my kids sin or when my kids are down, I don't see their sin. I'm not angry that they've sinned. I'm sad that they've looked for a happiness in a place that won't fulfill them. I'm sad they thought too little of themselves or they forgot who they are. And so you know, this is where it really takes work. That first step is to really acknowledge and, and think, gosh, God, God loves me as I am. Right? God thinks of me. Right? My students always love this philosophical truth, which is that because God is omnipotent and omniscient, because he's all powerful and everywhere, you know, if he were to cease to think about you, Vicente, you would cease to exist. If he were to, to cease to think about me, I would cease to exist. God is constantly thinking about us. God loves us. God has this incredible paternal heart that wants nothing more for us to be with him. So that takes a lot of really, in some ways, getting over ourselves to recognize, man, God. God sees something in me that I, I often forget myself. So that's, that, that takes a lot of work. It does. So just entering into the reality of who you are. The second thing that takes work is, is that becoming who God sees. So when accepting it, but then becoming that which God sees you, which is all about growing in virtue, which is all about reaching back, right? God is there reaching out 
And what is he doing? He's calling to us in our sin. He's calling to us in our brokenness. And he's not there with a hand reached out to, to, to smite us, right? He's there with a hand reached out to hold us. And, and he says, where are you? Right? Where are you now that you've sinned? Right? And, and, and think of that for a moment, how beautiful and how you know, invitational that is. So it, the Christian life takes work. This constant response to the Lord and, and this constant acceptance of what the Lord sees in us and what he's made us for. And when we recognize who we are, and we participate in God's plan to become the person God has called us to be, then we become really beautiful witnesses to others, right? I mean, I, I love sharing the love of the Father with people. And, and very often it goes like this, hey, I'm still figuring out, right? It's not as if I go before people and say, oh, I stand before you as one who has overcome sin. No, I come before you broken and with the same messes I carry as when I'm a teenager. But, but I know who I am, and I'm participating with God's plan to grow in virtue, to, to seek after those things that will make me truly happy. And, and that's a, a beautiful adventure. You know, the, the Christian life, among everything else, is a call to adventure, to discover who we are and what we are made for. And I, I, I believe you said two important things. I, I really like the image that you say that receiving the Eucharist is a very, very important moment. But as we get out of the church, there's another important moment. And I think it's, it's a reminder that we are both call and sent, right? A lot of us like to be called, but we, we forget about we are also sent. And I, I, I believe in, in, before moving on, I, I like to go deeper on this because I think acknowledging you know, I can acknowledge that I'm the son of God. I sounds good. It's, 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 it gives me affirmation, right? I'm the son of an uh, all-powerful being. But becoming, I have a little more challenge than becoming, right? And I think a lot of us have within us, through our, our lives, different crises that remind us of, the, of this challenge. How do we become? So I don't know if, uh, Ryan, if you can talk a little bit about the becoming part, because I believe that a lot of the people that are listening uh, have seen themselves and I'm like, okay, I understand it, but how do we get there? How do we become constantly throughout throughout our lives? Yeah, St. Jose Maria Escriva says it really beautifully. He says, God makes us saints, not in spite of our lives, but through them, right? And so... The reality is, is that, that we become holy, we become virtuous by, by practicing and, and, and by you know, doing those in the day in and day out and in the little things. I mean, you know, the, the truth is God is constantly giving us opportunities. Um, I, I took a lot of solace in a beautiful phrase that uh, one of my spiritual directors said, uh, a beautiful man, Father Francis Martin, who passed away years ago. In fact, the year he died, he was a, he, every, a lot of people in Chicago knew him, isn't there? The year he died is when the Cubs won the pennant, and everyone joked that was his first miracle because he loved baseball. He grew up, you know, at, uh, you're there at Wrigley, and anyhow, he used to say that God hits you three thousand easy grounders a day. Right? God is constantly giving you opportunities to depend on Him, to grow in holiness, to practice the virtues. But we're lucky if we see thirty, and we're even more lucky if we field three. And I remember hearing that from a really holy priest, thinking, "Wow, that's that's actually good news." Right? That God loves us so much, he's constantly giving us opportunities. And, and right, we're, we're not going to bat. We're not, you know, we're not Virgin Maria. We're not, we're not Mother Mary. We're not, geez, we're not going to bat 100%. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop from trying, right? From constantly trying to see where God is reaching out to us. And the truth is, is that we grow in life holiness. And we grow specifically in virtue by taking advantage of those opportunities. You know, when, when I pray for patience, you know, God has the ability to infuse me with patience, but he doesn't. Rather, he'll put me in the longest line in the grocery store, or the slowest lane of traffic. Why? Because he wants me to grow in that virtue on my own, right? Just like a great musician, right? Becomes a great musician, not by just being infused with it, but by building upon their innate talent and practicing and really become. So this becoming takes time. It takes effort. It takes work. It takes showing up and it takes a really deep, you know, profound trust and that the Lord is working through you. You know, even those moments that you just don't see how he's working through you, right? Um, I remember going to confession one time. It was with an old priest and uh, he was 90 years old and it was a communal penance. And so you can imagine the scene where everything I say, he repeats back, but very loudly because he can't hear very well. 
So the line behind me is getting longer and longer, right? Because people don't want to listen in on my sins in the confessional. And I look at them and I say, Father, you know, será más fácil? Will, will it get any easier? And he looks at me and he goes, no, no. And I, I remember being so crestfallen. And then he gets this big smile on his face. And he says, no, but you will get stronger. It won't get easier, but you will get stronger. And that's the beautiful truth about the Christian life, about, about why it takes to work. Right? Is that our crosses don't get smaller. It's just that we get stronger to carry them. Right? And, and all of a sudden, all these, these vices, all these sins that are, that are distortions of the truth, that are things in which we think are going to make us free or we think are going to make us happy, start, start to be you know, redirected and, and turned into something that will really make us you know, more like God. I mean, all of our natural strengths and weaknesses are, are, are beautiful, but, but they have to be attuned and directed. Just like our desire for pleasure, our desire for you know, uh, affirmation are good things, but they must be directed towards their proper end. And, and so much of the book is not really high theology. You know, so much of the book is just trying to, to really dive into the wisdom of, of the faith on, on these specific things. What does it mean to, 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 to work? <laughs> what does it mean to, to, to become a Christian? What does it mean to to accept our mission and then to enter into it. And what does this mean in terms of growing in virtue? Uh, which leads us to that, that third forgotten truth, which is that grace builds on nature, right? Yeah, I, before we, we, we move to unpack that, I think uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteen says that faith can only grow as you practice it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's, it's very simple. You know, you want to grow in your faith, show up. Practice it, you know. You want to get better in baseball, show up, practice it. I I think practice, practice, practice is important. And I think the intentionality we, we practice, right? I, I think it's also important. So yeah, thank you. That was that was wonderful. I I, I liked it. So third forgotten truth. Grace build, deals upon nature. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, so the, the truth is everything God has made is good. But, but the fall has disordered it. The fall has, has made us seek to find our fulfillment in insufficient things, right? This is the disordering of our intellect and our will. And so what we often think is that we think nature is bad, but the truth is, no, nature is good, and grace actually builds upon it. So everything God does to share his love with us, right, uh, in, in many ways is pointed out to us. We can come to know God and his providential care for us just by looking at his creation. And the truth is God does not want to destroy us. So the goal of God is not to overcome who we are. The, the, the goal of God is to transform us into who he made us to be. And, and so often we think of the Christian life as a matter of overcoming our nature. That's the wrong way to think about it. Now, it's, it's not a matter of overcoming our nature. It's about liberating ourselves from our fallen nature. Right? It's about saying yes to, to all the things God wants to give us. And saying no to those things that are just too small for us, just beneath us, just a waste of our time. Um, and, and so I think you know, this, this perennial teaching of the church has to really be rediscovered. And the truth is, probably the last 500 years of Christian theology, you know, um, especially even here in America, you know, a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters, you know, praise God, we share so much in common with them. But very often they see the fall as leading towards total depravity. They see the fall as like, Nothing is good in nature. There's nothing redeemable about it. And so God has to overcome nature. That's not a Catholic vision. No, God, God doesn't want to overcome you, right? God doesn't want, God doesn't see you as a problem, right? Rather, God sees us as, as little kids who are seeking after things that will never fulfill us, right? The beautiful description of C.S. Lewis is like a little kid who's, you know, making mud pies on the beach while there's this beautiful feast and beautiful party behind him, right? And that's kind of what it is in life. And so grace builds upon nature. Like God's invitation comes to where we are, meets us in the moment. God wants to liberate you know, who we are. Think of the saints for a moment. You know, one of the great truths that we had so much fun researching in the book, we quote over, you know, the saints over 200 times, uh, in addition to contemporary you know, philosophers and historians and politicians and others, you know, that, that the God, you know, when St. Peter was converted, none of his fiery zeal was removed. Right. Think of think of Peter all the time. Peter messed up. Right. <laughs> Jesus even said after Jesus declares that, that, that Peter will hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven and earth, that whose sins he forgives are forgiven, whose sins he binds are bound. Immediately after that, 
Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because Peter is being an obstacle because Peter and his passion and zeal wanted to avoid any harm for Christ. But that same passion and zeal, after, after Peter is converted, after Christ was resurrected, what do we see? Peter's in the boat and Peter jumps out of the boat with total zeal, right? doesn't even wait to row ashore. So what happens is, is, is because grace built off nature, who we are in terms of who God has made us, God just wants to perfect. God wants to, to liberate. He doesn't want to destroy it. He doesn't want to change who you are. He wants to transform you into who he's really made you to be. And the beautiful truth is we all know this. Like we all know deep down, right? Like we know at the end of the day, the problem of like sin, whatever it might be, big or small, is that somehow it's against who we are and, and who we really know that we're called to be. And we hear this voice calling us towards greatness, calling us to be holy, calling us to authentic happiness. And that's why we get so sad when we fall for the tricks and lies of the devil to, to, to seek that happiness elsewhere. But this is the constant challenge is to recognize that we are good and, and God seeks to build upon that goodness. And even though we may have forgotten who we are, God hasn't. Right? So God is constantly calling us to reach back to him and constantly calling us to, to participate with his plan. That means using our very biology, how he's made us. We, we spend a lot of time in the book talking about the temperaments. In fact, the book's really sort of three parts. We talk about the battle, which in the battle, you know, the battle between good and evil, the battle to remember who we are. And in that battle, we talk about these four forgotten truths. And then we have a temperament assessment called the spiritual audit. And then the rest of the book is really about growing in those virtues. And we take each virtue and we just dive into it. You know, what's the Bible say about it? What saints lived it? Given your, your temperament, given your nature, whether you're choleric, whether you're motivated by action or sanguine, motivated by people or phlegmatic, motivated by peace and harmony or, or motivated by ideas, what we quote, historically is called the melancholic, you know, given your temperament, how God has made you, you know, how to build the virtues upon that. And so, so much of understanding grace building upon nature is recognizing who you are as God has made you. And that's good, right? Um, you know, our fallen nature is not because it's a privation uh, of who we really are. And part of this is rediscovering, hopefully with great joy, that God has a, has a better way for us. God has a plan for us. Yeah, Ryan, I, I believe that's very important to acknowledge that everything that God created, us included, is good. And that his grace is going to build up on what he has already created. And I feel that a lot of times we feel that, you know, uh, that we need to change who we are or that, you know, oh, you know, I'm never going to be able to be, be different. And I think it's, it's beautiful to just understand and hear it. It's part of affirmation. God created us good. And his grace is going to make us better. And I, I, for everybody that is listening to, to us right now, I believe that know that you can be better. Know that you can be better. Know that you are worth more. Know that you were made for more. Know that there is a bigger purpose for you. Because I know, and I, I'm speaking from my own experience, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget. So may this conversation serve you, serves you as a reminder that you are meant to be better because you can do better. You know, how? Making better decisions, but also with the grace of God. So uh, with that, I'd like to, to go to, to the last uh, forgetten, forgotten truth, and is we were meant... We were never meant to go through life alone, and I and I think as we go as we go through different moments, a lot of times when we go through through life with and our hard moments, we tend to isolate ourselves. And I think this is also a reminder that hey, you're not supposed to do this alone. Yeah, we are made for community. I mean, we're made for not only friendship with God but friendship with each other. And you know, so much of this we can't do it on our own. Just we need to hear because very often we think that's what we need to do, that we need to solve the problem ourselves. We need to you know, pull ourselves up. And yes, we're called to participate. Yes, we're called to reach back. But we're, we're made by God to, to do that with others. And so we have Holy Mother Church to guide us. We have the Holy Spirit to you know, empower us and, and to, to, to give us and, and really in some ways inspire us to say yes to God's grace. But we also have each other. You know, we have the, the lives of the saints. We have our family. We have our friends. And we're not meant to do it on our own. We never were. And what happens is interesting. If you know, if you look at think of our own lives for a moment. I mean, you know, as you're whoever's listening. I mean, 
think of whatever sin you know you've struggled with and and and, and maybe it's not a sin, maybe it's some deficiency in your own character. Maybe it's some challenge or struggle you have. You're know, very often the first thing that happens is, is you rationalize it. Right? Oh, it's not as bad as other people. I remember talking to a guy who was in prison, um, who was there actually, you know, hardened criminal. He was there for murder. I remember talking to him. He goes, well, I'm not as bad as the other guy. He killed more people than I did. As if somehow you know, you're rationalizing murder because it's not as bad as a guy who killed more people. But we do that, right? We run away, we hide, and we rationalize. It's not that bad or I deserve it. And then the moment we start to doubt that, the moment we say, you know, maybe I'm not, maybe that, that's not who I am, then, then we hear the, the voice immediately accuse us. We hear this in scripture, right? So the devil says, oh, you're free to do whatever you want. You can eat of anything. You can go against God, right? God's withholding some good from you. You go do what you want. You do you. And then the moment you do that and you realize it it's, hasn't worked out the way you want, immediately the accusations come in. I can't believe you did that. Why are you, you know, why do you struggle that way? Why do you always sin? How horrible you are. God can't love you. No one can love you. So we move from this sort of rationalization immediately to despair. And then we do the next step, which is we isolate ourselves. And the devil knows this. This is like straight from the mouths of hell, right? Like do whatever you want. The moment you do it, how dare you do that? And then you'll go hide. And, and this isolation is a killer. And unfortunately, we live today in isolation. We live very fragmented lives away from each other. I would challenge every listener with every good friend you have, stop asking people how they're doing. Not that that's not important. We want to know how people are doing, but ask them how they are. If you know them, ask them about their struggles. Ask the question, how's your prayer life? How's your vocation? How's your discernment? You know, my, my brothers um, in faith, you know, the men's group that I belong to, that we walk together you know, they know what I struggle with. I call them up when I have need. And when they see me, you know, we sure we talk about work and the family, but we always start with, hey, how's your prayer life? How are you doing? How's the Lord working through you? You know, are, are you struggling with alcohol? Whatever, you know, whatever the struggle might be. Those should be the conversations. I mean, St. Paul tells Timothy, we should spend our time building each other up. I mean, yeah, the weather might be important. You know, like <laughs> your general feelings might be important, but but much more important is is are you entering in to the mission God has given you? Are you becoming more of who you're called to be or less? And I think, you know, so much of this, you know, not doing it alone is to recognize the importance of community, to recognize the importance of the church, to recognize the importance of our brothers and sisters in faith. Um, you know, I can't tell you what, what a difference, even just personally, that has made in my own life. To have people who know who I am, that when I forget who I am, that they can remind me who I am, that they can be there to lift me up. They can be there to, to point me in the right direction or, or be there to affirm me. I remember Vicente, we had a group of, of 40 pareja, uh, uh, parejas, right? Couples, yeah? In preparation for marriage. And in este grupo, tuvimos 20 hombres y, y 20 mujeres. Y cuando están preparando, pedimos a todos para vivir como hermano y hermana, right? Cuando está preparando para matrimonio. And, and all of them were previously married. Like, in other words, they were married civilly, but not in the church. And so cuando están preparando para las tres meses, you know, es necesario para vivir como hermano y hermana, para esperar, para compartir en, en sexualidad después matrimonio. And so we had a sign, and the sign was this. When the men walked in, and we, it was like they would raise their hands like this when they walked into church, if, if they had been faithful and they had, had abstained and entered into the battle, right? Just for three months to, 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 to really protect themselves and hold themselves, right? Because they were married civilly, but they, they, they hadn't been married in the church. And so they would do that. And I remember we didn't have any Sunday where all 40 guys walked in like this. Not like, you know, 35 guys would, five win it. And for the 35 that would, we would all clap. And for the five guys that wouldn't, we would all give them a hug and say, hey, it's all right. You know, talk to them and, and inspire them. Well, one day, 39 guys in a row came in like this. Like, yeah. And the last guy's coming in. And we're all waiting. Like, every single guy there is, like, waiting. And you know that scene in, there's a scene in Braveheart, right? There's, like, a battle scene where all the warriors, like, go crazy yelling freedom. So the last guy walks in. And he's just, like, has this look on his face and he slowly puts his arms up like this and the entire place went nuts. You never heard 20 guys or 40 guys. you like, just erupt into like this, you know, and, they, and one of the guys started yelling freedom. Right. But the idea is that, that we, we, we need brothers in arms, right? We need to encourage each other. 
And when we fail, we need to be there to lift each other up. And this is what the Christian community has been doing for 2,000 years, right? To the brother, to the sister, and to the stranger alike. To remind people who we are, what we're made for, and when we forget, to lovingly call people back into right relationship with God and his church. Yeah, as, as you were talking about, you know, asking the correct questions, I came to mind, Ryan, that many times we are surrounded by people and still are alone. Because we are not having the conversations that we are that we are meant to have, and I I've been at that place. I've been surrounded by people and I still feel alone because what is hurting me internally, uh, the people that are around me, they just don't know, or, or we haven't been able to have the space to talk about. Right. So I believe that it's important to talk about what is hurting us, and it's also important to to be intentional about. Not just hanging out with people, not just having conversations, but having the right conversations, the difficult conversations, the conversations that are going to uplift each other up. And I think that's also very important. Do not isolate, but when you have conversations with the people that you love and they love you, have the conversations that are going to make a difference. Be intentional about what you talk about. Be intentional about having purpose conversations, conversations that are going to lift each other up that are that are really going to be your community and i i think it's important ryan thank you so much uh i'm gonna leave the the final statements to you uh, i i would just encourage everybody that is listening to get the book buy the book i uh, i think it's a great tool for all of us that are uh trying but want to be striving to, towards uh, uh more Overlasting happiness to, to be, you know, in, in a better space in our lives, uh, and I, I think this is a, a great tool, Ryan. Yeah, you know, the the truth is God loves us as we are, right? <laughs> Dios te ama como eres. Right? He loves you as you are, but way too much to leave you that way, right? I mean, I mean, the truth is, you know, pero demasiado para dejarte así, right? You I mean just God is constantly calling out to us, and the, the beautiful truth is, is that. Through the wisdom of the church, you know, we're being called to participate with God's plan for our salvation. And that's not boring. It, it's, not, it's not meaningless. It is the most meaningful thing that we can do in our lives. And it will make us better husbands, better wives, better brothers, better sisters, better friends, better co-workers. And so we wrote The Willpower Advantage, you know, not as a deep theology book, but as a practical, really, rediscovery of, of, of the greatest adventure of our lives which is to discover our mission and become the person that our creator, that our father has made us to be. And the great news that he doesn't leave us to do this alone, that God himself is reaching out to us. He's giving us the grace through his sacraments. He's calling us to reach back. And so we hope people will read the book. We hope people will will enter into conversations with their friends about it. We hope people will will learn more about themselves and, and really dive into the virtues they need. We provide 13 virtues in the book that we, we do a deep dive into, and, and we always end the chapters with some really practical advice, right? If you're motivated by action or you're motivated by certain things in your life, your particular temperament, some really practical ways in which you can grow in that virtue um, and overcome those vices that, that you know, really do rob us of peace and, and still our joy. So God loves you. God wants nothing more than to be in relationship with you, and God is calling us calling us to participate in his plan to become the person he's called us to be. So um, I hope the book has helped for your readers. It's been a blessing for myself. I mean, Tom and I wrote it for ourselves more than anything else. And if it can be a blessing to others, uh, we're, we're so thrilled with that. No, thank you, Ryan, for this wonderful conversation, for everybody that is listening. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to share the good news, to share, the, the, as, as Ryan said, the joy of the gospel. And uh, God bless you all. Listen with us and experience the joy of the gospel. Escúchanos y experimenta la alegría del evangelio. Te esperamos. Dare to dream. Atrévete a soñar.